Good morning. You know what I like to see is people trickle in and come in. I like seeing people come in. They're smiling and they're happy to see each other and I see some fist bumps going on and people turn around. Hey, good to see you. It just makes me feel so good. It's why I sit in the back so that I can observe everyone without judgment. No, it's really nice to be here. And I, I really do love seeing everyone smile and, and, and love on each other. I really, really enjoy ex- being able to experience that. Today's lesson is called The Exceedingly Righteous Enemy. And I got to be honest, we don't normally think of our enemies as exceedingly righteous, do we? But I think we have a bigger problem than that. Our bigger problem is we actually go looking for an enemy to begin with. Uh, some of you may not get on social media as, as much. Some of you may be on maybe more than you should be. I, I'm probably in that latter group. It's as if people go and they're looking for an enemy to fight. And they're going to stand at their keyboard or on their phone and they will take on that enemy head on digitally. And they're just looking for someone to look at and say, you are wrong. I am right. Let me tell you why I'm right and you're wrong. And we we go on the lookout for enemies. We've done this all for as long as there have been humans. We've been doing this. Always looking for an enemy to fight. And Jesus tells us we should instead be looking for a neighbor to love. But that's less fun, isn't it? We don't don't get to put our self-righteous clothing on if we are looking for a neighbor to love. We feel better about ourselves if we find someone that we think is wrong, or maybe they actually are wrong, and, and we just go to town on proving them wrong. And Jesus tells the story of this this enemy of Israel, this opponent, this adversary of Israel who is better than they are. When he begins the story, they they don't know where he's going with it. It's, It's one of those stories, you may know the story called the Good Samaritan. That's what we call it, but I want to give our parables new names so we can see it from a different perspective. And this one I have called the Exceedingly Righteous Enemy. Because we often look at our enemies and we don't think of them as being more righteous than we are. We think of them as being less righteous or completely unrighteous. So Jesus tells them this story. A couple of weeks ago I did a sermon, it was 20 minutes long, and some of you came and told me just how much you appreciated a good, quick sermon. <laughs> and I swore that day I would never do that again. This shouldn't take long, it's a short story. But it is a powerful story. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He asks a really good question. And throughout church history, we've provided a multitude of answers to this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And we will go all over scripture except for the Old Testament. We'll go all over Scripture to find the answer to what must I do to inherit eternal life. We'll go to Paul. We'll read Romans. We'll read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Thessalonians, books of Timothy. We'll read them all. And we will create a list of things that you do to inherit eternal life. And I'll be honest, I have a problem with that. Because Jesus gives an answer, and we ignore his answer. Isn't it weird that we will ignore the words of Jesus the same way that we would ignore the Old Testament? But they're connected because Jesus uses the Old Testament to answer the question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? I find his response baffling. Given my upbringing and given what I was taught from childhood on. Because if someone came to you, and I know I've said this before, but if someone came to you and said, brother, sister, what do I have to do to be saved? What do I got to do to inherit eternal life? 
we probably would not go to Luke chapter 10. I shared on a Wednesday night class that someone, Wednesday night or here, I forget when it was. I'm getting old. I forget when it was. And someone wrote on Facebook and asked a question about what, are our, what is our teaching about how to be forgiven of sins. And I was in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount class and I, I wanted to show them forgive others and that God will forgive you the same way and that's how you're forgiven of sin. I didn't share that passage, but I really, really wanted to because I want to take the words of Jesus seriously. And it might sound weird, but I, I think we've, in some ways, we failed to take the words of Jesus seriously. So this teacher of the law asked Jesus a question, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus does what none of us would do. None of us would say, well, what's the book of Deuteronomy say? What do you find there? That's not what we would do. And sadly, what we also wouldn't do is, well, what does Luke chapter 10 have to say? What do you find there? We say, well, what does Paul say, right? Give me some Romans. Love me some Romans. And I do. I love the book of Romans. But I think it's to our own, I'm trying to think of the right word, detriment. When we ignore the words of Jesus and how he answers this question. He says, what is written in the law? What do you read there? In other words, the answer to your question is already written down somewhere in what we call the Old Testament. So he reverses the question and says, how would you answer it? Teaching the law, he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is something we all agree with. If you were to summarize the law and the prophets, they hang on these two commands, love God, love neighbor. Very simple, very hard to do especially if you're always looking for an enemy. But that's it. That is the heart of God. That is the heart of the law. Love God, love neighbor. The man answers correctly. If you do these things, this is what Jesus says. And he said to him, and Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. And I want to tell you that we don't actually believe that. When someone comes to us and says to us, what do I have to do to enter the family of God? What do I got to do to be saved? What do I got to do to inherit eternal life? What do I... We don't tell them this. This is what Jesus tells them. He says, you're right. How have we ignored the right answer? He says, you have given the right answer. Do this. Do what? Love God, love your neighbor, and you're in. It's wild. I know for some of us you're thinking, oh, Robin, you're kind of you're missing something. I know, I know there's a whole lot of other things written in other places. But when Jesus is asked the question, he says you're right. The problem this man has, and he has a problem like all of us, we all got problems. His problem isn't that he doesn't understand the right answer. He knows the right answer. He absolutely knows the right answer. And Jesus says, you'll do it. You do it. You have eternal life. It's yours. Love God. Love neighbor. Done. But wanting to vindicate himself. Now, why would you ever want to vindicate yourself? Because you have an enemy. You have someone you don't like. And you want to justify yourself and say, yeah, love my neighbor, but is that fellow over there my neighbor? Is Amir my neighbor? Do I have to love him too? I don't know, do I? 
We have people that we want to qualify and say, yeah, but they don't count. We found our enemy. And so this man wants to justify himself. He wants to vindicate himself. And he asks Jesus another question. And who is my neighbor? And now comes the story we're all familiar with. I'm trying to imagine being this teacher of the law and thinking, why are you telling me a story? Just give me an answer or reverse the question on me, but why are you telling me a story? Now, remember what we said earlier, parables open up our eyes to realities that we would otherwise keep our eyes shut to. Right? They open up realities that we'd otherwise not want to accept or see. And so Jesus begins one of his most popular, at least in modern day, parables. It's hard to preach a sermon series on parables and not do this one. Jesus replied, in answer to his question, and who was my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Right, so you have the picture, someone coming back from Jerusalem, they're on the way down to Jericho, they're on this dirt, dirt path, and they're, they're attacked, and they're robbed, and they're beaten, and they're stripped half naked, and they're left there to die. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This is quite the unexpected turn for this expert of the law. He would think, oh, a priest is coming. Good! This guy will be saved! No, but he's ignored. He crosses on the other side. Tries to avoid this man who's in desperate need of help. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. Doesn't want to help. In the ancient world, in the modern world, we like things in threes. We just like stories in threes. And we, this expert in law, he knows there's the third one coming. You got priest, Levite, teacher of the law. Right? And the third one's always the hero, which in this case, the third one is the hero. But it's not an expert in the law. Not an expert in the law at all. But a Samaritan while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. Now, I know most of us are familiar with who the Samaritans are and, and the dislike and the enmity between the people of Israel and the people of Samaria. They absolutely hated one another. You may be familiar, remember the story where Jesus and his disciples, just a chapter earlier, are going through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem, and they stop in Samaria to try and find a place to stay. And the Samaritans won't have a place for Jesus to stay. They reject him. And the two disciples say, what? Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven and consume them? You don't say that about people you love. You know who you say that about? An enemy. Jesus, we gave them a fair shake. They didn't take it. Let's kill them all. That's what you say about people you hate. That's what you say about people you despise. You don't say that about your neighbor. And in their case, physically, neighbors. So Jesus twists the story. It's not an expert in the law. It's not a scribe. It's a Samaritan. And when this, is, when this Samaritan passes by, he sees this man. And he does the right thing. He's an exceedingly righteous enemy. He's moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Jesus looks at the teacher of the law and says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands 
of robbers. Now, this is an interesting question because the, the teacher of law, he's trying to figure out who is my neighbor. And Jesus turns the question around. He says, which one of these was a neighbor? How did he become a neighbor? He became a neighbor by doing what was right. By doing what was right. And he says, which one of these was a neighbor to the man who ha- fell into the hands of robbers? He said, without saying the Samaritan, because he couldn't bring himself to do it, probably, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. That's our story. That's it. That's our story. A whole story that's created for us to answer the question, how do we inherit eternal life? And the answer is, love God, love neighbor. And he says, I don't like some of my neighbors. And Jesus says, even them. Don't just love them, act like them. When they act like that, act like them. They're willing to do what you weren't willing to do. Go and do. This is it. This is the last slide. You're welcome. Maybe we need to stop asking about, is that person my neighbor? Do I need to love them? Do I need to love that person? Do I need to love that person? Are they my enemy? I think maybe I should hate them. I think maybe I should despise them. I think maybe they should, they should move and go somewhere else and go live some, some other, other place where I don't have to be around them. I, I think that's what I want. We need to stop asking who our neighbor is and start actually being a neighbor. In our Sermon on the Mount class on Wednesday nights, which we wrapped up a couple of weeks ago, and in our Book of Deuteronomy class, which we're we're still doing on Sunday mornings, this theme of go and do rises to the top. Go and do likewise. Go and be a neighbor. Instead of saying, is he my neighbor? You decide to be their neighbor. I'm going to be a neighbor. I will love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to be the neighbor they need me to be. You may not realize this, and sometimes it's hard to remember, but you don't have any enemies. You don't. You simply do not. It's an election year. You might feel like you do, but you do not. Someone might consider you an enemy, but you don't consider yourself an enemy to them. You're their neighbor. And when they show up and they need help or they need something from you, you don't withhold it from them because they're not my neighbor. No, you're the neighbor to them. Go and do. Go and do. We've lost this. Go and do part of our Christian faith. Our Christian faith has often become, go and believe a certain thing. But Jesus constantly reminds us and says, no, it's go and do. Then you'll, have inter- and you'll, then you'll inherit eternal life. Go and do. When he finishes the Sermon on the Mount, he says, those who are wise will listen to my words and do them. Those who are unwise will listen to my words and not do them. The Christian faith is something that you practice. It's something that you do. It's not just something you believe between your two ears. It's something you do. It's something that happens when you leave here. And you go out to wherever it is you go, either back home or to a restaurant, you go shopping or there's a party or there's a get together, you have to go to work after this, whatever it is. Christianity is something that you do as you go. And when you see someone who is in need, who wants someone to talk to, 
or has a physical need, you don't pass by. You go and you do. You go and you do. Stop looking for enemies because you don't have any. You don't have any physical enemies, not a single one. All you have are neighbors, and all you are is a neighbor. So go out there and be Mr. Rogers. He was a good guy. Fred Rogers was a really good guy. Presbyterian minister. And invite people to be your neighbor. Stop picking fights with people. Stop going out into the world trying to find some small difference between you and them and exploit that to make them look like the most wicked person you've ever met. Instead, go out and find some sort of commonality with people and build on that commonality instead of building on a difference. You can never be the neighbor to the people around you if all you do is build on the differences between you and them. You've got to build on the commonalities between you and them. So I invite you and I invite myself to go and do likewise.